This is the Commission Church Online. Welcome to our podcast. We want to be a church who brings heaven on earth through the word of God and the love of Christ. I pray this week's message blesses you. How many of y'all are ready to receive the word this morning? Amen. All right. All right. That's good. Amen. Uh, Like I said, I'm going to take a break from the gospel according to Matthew over the next few weeks. Uh, and I want to I want to address the church, and I want to share my heart uh, with the church this Sunday. And I know Alex is going to bring the word next Sunday, but uh, I want to I want to mention something very very uh, distinctly this morning. Uh, we are in the middle of a spiritual warfare. Amen. Uh, spiritual warfare is no joke. Uh, it's something that we don't shy away from. It's something that we don't take lightly. Uh, there are times in our church, church, in uh, different ministries, and different organizations that uh, that we are we are setting ourselves up for growth and God is doing amazing things for example uh, it was just a week ago that we celebrated our our fourth birthday amen and uh, we're stepping into five years yeah uh, and we're, se- we're we're stepping into year five of what God is about to do in our church and I believe that the enemy does not take that lightly he he does not appreciate it uh, if I have to be very honest and uh, and every single time we have been faced with a situation like this uh, where we've been propelled for growth, we've been set up for growth, and we've been set up for victory, the enemy always tries to work his stuff around to tear those things down and, and to bring his plans to affect God's agenda and God's kingdom being established in and through the ministries that work so hard week after week. See, when when you're in a fight, some people don't understand or don't know how to term it, don't know what to call it. Uh, some people don't shy away from the aspect of spiritual warfare. As a matter of fact, a lot of you go through spiritual warfare in your own lives. You go through spiritual warfare in your marriages. You go through spiritual warfare in your personal lives, in your jobs, in your relationships. Uh, Spiritual warfare is very rampant, but our inability to see and understand spiritual warfare often causes us to go to a place of, of deception where the enemy lies to us, where the enemy tries to hide from us. The truth of the matter is that you and I have a spirit being. We have a spirit inside of us. And the reality of life is that spirit man is at war all the time. All right? Be it when when it's good times, bad times, it doesn't matter. The spirit man is always at war. All of us, we have a spirit inside of us. We, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. See, you don't need to work to become spiritual. That's not something that you have to actively do. You are spiritual. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You only need to remember that fact. You and I as Christians need to remind ourselves that the Holy Spirit is inside of us. We need to remind ourselves that the war that we're about to fight or the war that we're under is not a war that is common. It's not a war that we will fight using flesh and blood. It's not a war that we will use fighting to fight using the the weapons of warfare that this world has to offer. But because the Holy Spirit is in you and because God is in you, God empowers the spirit that you have. For some of us, it's the feelings of anger and angst. And for some of us, it's the the, the nervousness or the tension or that you wrestle in your life. And for so many of us, we, 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 we don't know how to put language to our struggle. And what I wish to do this morning is try to put some language, some biblical, a biblical narrative, a biblical language, a biblical uh, uh, an understanding to the, the angst that we feel in our hearts from time to time. And we don't understand where it's coming from. Some of us wonder why are we in a fight? I want to I remind people this morning that uh, the fight from the enemy is inevitable. See, the Bible, Bible even reminds us that. He, he, the Bible doesn't say the weapon wouldn't form. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that oh, although the weapon may form, it will not prosper. That's what the Bible says. So there is this undeniable reference or this undeniable knowledge of the fact that the weapons of warfare are real. That spiritual warfare is real. God even does not deny that. Jesus does not deny that. He says you will be in spiritual warfare. It's bound to happen. It's going to happen. But he says that they won't prosper over you. You have authority. You have the power to subdue every force and attack of the enemy. 
I want to remind somebody today that you and I are equipped by the Holy Spirit to look at every attack that comes against us and say we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Can I hear an amen? Amen. There is power in that. That Jesus looks at us and says, man, I'm not saying that weapons won't form, but even though the weapons form against you, the Christian has what it takes to look at those weapons and say, you shall not prosper over me. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6, I want to turn your attention to there. Uh, 2 Timothy 4 and 6, the Bible says this. Paul is almost at the end of his life here. And Paul is talking about this, this, this experience that he's having. And he's saying in verse number 6, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 6 to 8. Verse 6, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I'm, I'm, I'm done with this earthly journey that I've been on is what he's saying. And then he goes on to say this. Now listen, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the fight. Henceforth, verse 8, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Now, this is powerful. I want to title my message this morning, The Good Fight. The Good Fight. It's kind of an oxymoron of sorts because a fight is never a good thing, right? How many of you have been in a fight and you're like, that's the best thing that's ever happened to me, right? I lost a tooth. Yeah, I, that, that was amazing. I, I, I bruised myself or I bruised someone else. That's a great, no, no, no. I, it, it's never a good thing. A fight is never a good thing. But I want to title my message, A Good Fight. I'm praying that us as Christians will say at the end of our Christian walks and our journey, I pray that we will also be able to muster courage in our faith journeys to be able to declare and say that you and I, we have fought the good fight. How many of you can say, no matter how many oppositions I had to endure, I fought with everything I had. A good soldier will say, I fought the good fight. A good soldier, a good Christian, a good believer will say, I have finished the race. There was this race that was set in front of me and I have finished it. A good Christian will say, I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. Stop fighting for the wrong reasons, y'all. Fight the good fight. If you're in a fight, fight for the good reasons. Fight for noble reasons. Fight for righteous reasons. Stop fighting for the wrong things. The problem is we have a lot of Christians fighting for the wrong things that we get caught up and we don't know why we're going through why we're going through. And and, and the Holy Spirit is reminding us, stop fighting battles that you were never meant to to start. Stop fighting battles that you were never meant to begin and, and, and never meant to be in. Stop running other people's races. We're so, we're so, it, it, it causes us so much joy to run other people's races. We always want to be in other people's shoes. You know, we, we always like other people's gardens and other people's uh, pastures. And we always see other people's uh, grass and we're like, oh, that's green. But God has called you and I to nurture what we already have. See, we're not animals. Animals are the ones that graze in one pasture and then they scoot. They go from one pasture to the other pasture to the other pasture. God is looking at you and me and saying, I've given you a pasture. Stay true to it. Stay faithful to it. What happens, Pastor, when the grass runs out? You fertilize. Come on. You water your pasture. You never set yourself up to where your pasture runs out. God is restoring you. God is renewing you. You and I are not animals where we just feed and we leave. God gives us certain things in our lives. He gives us a race. For some of us, that race is your work. For some of us, that race is your marriage. For some of us, that race is our, 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 our relationships or the things that we have, our business or whatever it is that is going on for us. And God is challenging us this morning. Are you staying true to your race? As much as you want to go on to somebody else's lane and as long as you, some, some of us want to run hurdles when God is like, no, you got to do a 100 meter dash. Some of y'all want to run a 5K when God's like, no, you got to do a 400 meter dash. Come on, I'm not talking to somebody. For some of us, God has set you up on a marathon. And, and, and you're like 100 meters in and you're like, uh, uh, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. Like stop living in someone else's faith. The Bible says I've kept the faith. 
It's important to walk in your faith. It's important to walk in your story. It's important to stay true. No matter how difficult it can get, no matter how difficult it may be, it's important to stand with integrity and say, this is my fight to fight. Come on, somebody. This is my race. This is my faith. And God has given me the ability to fight these things. Why? We ought to fight because in John chapter 10 and verse 10, the Bible reminds us that the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says, I have come so that you may have life and you may have life in abundance. That's what the enemy does. There's a force to steal your joy. There's this force to steal your love, your passion, all these things, your virtue, your destiny. But he can't steal the most important thing, which is the salvation that God has given inside of you. And as long as God has saved you and redeemed you and you are sealed for the day of redemption, the devil will look at you and say, I'm just going to steal your joy. And as long as he can steal your joy... As long as he can seal your peace, as long as he can seal those things that, are, that, that you feel is fleeting and temporary. But, but, but God is like, no, those things are permanent. Joy is permanent. It's not an in and out thing. It's permanent. When you and I understand that, it opens our heart to so much more. See, often spiritual warfare is the enemy's attempt to steal our happiness about what God is doing in our lives. Don't take that bait. I want to remind somebody today, double back on your peace and joy in God and his sovereignty over every situation in life and say, if God is for me, who can be against me? Spiritual warfare is about Christians and believers knowing the word of God and knowing what the word tells you so that you are able to give it back to the enemy. The problem is we're not equipped enough. Every time Jesus was tempted, and we're going to go there, every time Jesus was tempted by the devil, he used the word of God to counteract that attack. Am I talking to somebody? He used the word. Someone say, he used the word. This is important. The problem is a lot of Christians don't have the ability to use the word because they're spending time on other things but the word. Right? Like if I am spending time on Instagram the whole day on reels, and you're like, oh, 15 minutes more, and it's 2 a.m., and you're still on reels. Come on, am I talking to somebody? All, all your mind is equipped with is those songs that you heard. Come on. You, you pressed that hashtag and you heard. You watched every reel on Instagram that had that song attached to it. Come on. Am I talking to somebody? But when the enemy attacks you, you don't know the verse. You're like, what is that verse? You know the song. Because you were up till two in the morning. Oh, this is not you. It's just me. <laughs> we know those songs in the back of our head. Man, the radio comes on. That song comes on. Oh, I see some of y'all. In traffic. <laughs> in church? I, you're not even moving. <laughs> Am I talking to somebody? But he equips us with the reason Jesus was quick to, to dole the word out at the, at the devil was because the word was on his lips. How many of you are equipped? Come on, if you are not equipped, you will not be ready for the day of temptation. You will not be ready for the day that the enemy comes with all his weaponry wielding it at you. You're going to be caught like a a deer in the headlights because you don't know what to do. So what do you do instead? The world's weapons. You you start taking, and, and God's like, man, in the light of this, the Christian needs to decide that you need to fight the good. Someone say good fight. Anybody been in a fight before? Amy, I have. I've, I've been in a fight. There are a few unholy people like me in here. The rest of y'all are, you know, blessed, holy. We'll talk about that in a second. But man, it's like, like now is fight time. We're in election time right now. Am I talking to somebody? Like right now, everybody's fighting. Come on. Some of y'all that don't have an opinion about Jesus has an opinion about the parties now. Like, I'm seeing you on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, and I'm like, man, only if this person had this much of fervor for the things of God. I'm stepping on some toes, am I not? Like, only if you have the passion as much as you have for that political candidate that you're supporting and that you are standing up for, only if you have that much of passion about sharing about Jesus. Hmm. We're about to celebrate Thanksgiving. There's going to be family drama. How many of y'all ready for that? (laughs) Fights with siblings and fights with parents and fights with spouses and trolls on the internet and social media. You're fighting everywhere. I see you, you're fighting, man. There's, There's fights everywhere and that's the wrong kind of fight. 
The good fight is a different, the, the fight that I'm talking about is a good fight. Someone say good fight. The, 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 the good thing is there are things that you can fight for that are meaningful. I, I pray that some of y'all will understand that you are called as a Christian and a believer to fight for the right things. You have to fight for your friends. You have to fight for the gospel. It's important that you fight for the cross. Fight for your marriage. Fight for purity. Fight for your future. Fight for your spouse, fight for your children, your children, your, your marriage, your, your family, everything that is around you that God has anointed in your pasture, that is in your race. Fight for that. That's the good fight that we're talking about. Like I said, man, if you've ever gotten in a fight, you know, man, that it, that, that it would take for like, like someone to get personal with you in order for, for you to get like really, you know, like physical with somebody. Like somebody has to be in your face. Have you ever been there? I've been there. Sorry, I have to, I have to be, a, I'm a pastor, but I have to admit my weakness. It was many, many years ago before I became the pastor of this church, so you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> I still remember, this is back in India. That was the only fight I got into. I've never been in a fight before, but there are certain people that you defend that you're like, no, you just crossed the line. Am I talking to you? Like, have you ever been there before? It was my mom. I was, I was driving in this, this, uh, this taxi with my mom and we got out of the taxi and this, this, this taxi driver got into my mom and started cursing her out. And I said, how dare you speak to my mom like that? And he got out of the car and said, how dare you speak to me like that? And he threw the first punch. I promise you, he threw the first punch and I stopped him. My, my reflexes were real good. I stopped him and he was drunk. That was a good thing. I realized that later on because man, that breadth of, of, uh, of okay. And, and, and I just, <laughs> and, and I just remember, I don't know what happened after that. I remember just taking a swing and the dude was flat on the ground. I was scared out of my mind. I thought I killed a guy. I thought that I committed murder because this guy was not moving. But what would it take for someone to get into a physical altercation with someone? Like, uh, like, like you have to be invested in that person. That person has to be somebody that you're close with, something that you're close with, something that you're attached to. And I'm praying that us as Christians will open our eyes to the things that are valuable to us. Like, the enemy just doesn't come for anything and everything. He comes after the things that are valuable to us. The things that, we, that, that, that God has put in our lives that we have to shepherd, that we have to, to, to take care of. The fields and the pastures that we have to take care of. Those are the things that matter to the devil. As a believer, you're going to encounter these fights. You don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to fight. Today's a day of fight. That's, no one ever wakes up that way. But be, being prepared for it, being prepared for that situation, right? It's important to be aware that the tension of your soul is bigger than your life. There's this reality at play on, on another realm that you and I need to be aware of that every single day when you wake up in the morning, you got to understand, you got to be prayed up so much. You got to be fasted up so much. You got to be read up so much that every single time you wake up from, the, from your bed in the morning, the enemy has to quiver in his boots and say, here comes Ashish. Here comes Sonia. Here comes Amy. Here comes David. Here comes Jensen. Like he should be quivering in his boots because you are prepared for spiritual warfare. Yes. I'm never going to be blindsided by the enemy. I want, you, I want you to know that. Things might happen that I'm not aware of. Things might happen that I don't, I don't see coming at me, but I will not put myself in a place that when that hits me, I will be affected by it. I will be drowning in the, in the, in the weight of that, 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 that mess, so to speak. I want to encourage somebody today. This is a real fight. There's one thing I want to take, to take with you today is this is a real fight. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, the Bible says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the forces of spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I'm like, what? Like, this is crazy talk right here. Like, Paul is giving us some crazy, evil spirit, different dimension lingo here. And it spooks some people out. I don't know about you, but a lot of people come up to me and say, Pastor, I can do the, the Beatitudes. I can do the Sermon on the Mount. I can do the blessed are you if you do this and this and this and this. I can do all of that. But Pastor, this stuff? I don't know about that stuff, Pastor. That's kind of weird. That, that's kind of weird. That's kind of spooking me out. Some of y'all are like, man, I'm just, I'm just here to get an encouraging word. I don't want to hear all about the spiritual and evil forces. 
growing up, I, we couldn't watch, I, I couldn't watch He-Man. I remember my dad would be like, you can't watch He-Man. Every single time he would put his hands up in the air and the, everything would be like thunder and lightning. He'd be like, no, that's the devil. You can't do that. Like, we were shielded. I couldn't do that. I could watch Tom and Jerry. He was like, watch Tom and Jerry. That's good. <laughs> Like, when is it okay for us as Christians to look at the fights that you're going through every single day in your life? The fight with your boss. That's not just your boss in the picture. It's not a person. That's spiritual warfare. Come on, am I talking to somebody? When you're forced to do something that you're not supposed to do with, and you wrestle with your convictions, that is spiritual warfare. When, when it's at home, you're, it's not just an issue at home. It's not just a fight with your wife. It's just not an argument with your wife. It's just not an argument with your kids. It's just not your kids not listening to you. That is spiritual what? Warfare. Disunity, that's spiritual warfare. But verse 10 and 11, we read, we read 12 and 13, but 10 and 11, the Bible says, is finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Yes. You know what in essence it's saying? God is strong and he wants you to be strong. God is strong and he's enabled you to be strong. God never equips you and calls you his child and doesn't send you into the battlefield by yourself. He says, no, 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 you have certain weaponry and warfare to be able to look at the devices of the enemy and say, not today, Satan. I'm going to see that God is going to move on my behalf. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. But you got to believe what you're fighting for. Yes. Like you got to believe that you're worth fighting for. Like God said, man, I fight for you. Like heaven sent the perfect one to fight for you. It tells me that heaven puts value on you. How dare you put your situations and say, oh, it's going to be affected. So be it. No, no, no. If God puts value on you and the situations in your life, you should put value on the situations in your life. Call the enemy's bluff. Say this is warfare. And in the name of Jesus, I rebuke the power of enemy. Yes. Some of y'all are going to sit there and be like, pastor, don't you think we're over spiritualizing it? Don't you think that you're being over dramatic here? Nope. It's my wife we're talking about. <laughs> it's my husband we're talking about over here. It's our marriage we're talking. No, 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 no. Any attack of the enemy that's going to come. There are sometimes that I will look at Sonia and I will look at her and she will look at me and say, This is spiritual. I understand that this is an argument. I understand that this is a disagreement, but there's something more to it than that. This is spiritual and I need our spirit filled church to understand that that the enemy does not sit back and allow you to do what you do without having an objection he objects to you walking in the blessedness of Jesus walking in the fulfillment of your calling walking in what God has called you to do and I need some of our eyes to open this morning when the enemy came for you remember comes for you remember that God has equipped you Yes. Remember that God, he, the enemy just doesn't look at you as a person. He looks at a child of God. He looks at a person that God created. God made in his own image. The devil knew that walking into that garden when Eve and Adam were there, he knew who he was dealing with. People that were made in the image of God, yet he did not stop. So for people that ask me, brother, if I'm a child of God, then why does the devil have to attack me? Plain and simple. It's because he doesn't like that you are in a garden that God has put you in. He has put you in a pasture of blessing and he wants to take that away from you. Hmm. Yeah. But he looks at you and says, man, God, God, God looks at you and says, I've given you a helmet of salvation. I can't get into this because this is a different like sermon series altogether. But he says, if he's coming for your head, I've given you the helmet of salvation. If he's coming for your chest, I've given you, come on, the breastplate of righteousness. If he's coming for your waist, I've given you the belt of truth. I've given you the shield of faith. I've given you the sword of the spirit. You are not ill-equipped. You are fully equipped as a Christian to go into warfare and say, not today, Satan. I want us to understand this, church. This is not spiritual. No, no, no. This is truth. This is the word of God. Like this might sound spooky to some of y'all, but arrows are being aimed at your home every single day. He's picking the best ones and he's aiming it at your marriage. 
He's aiming it at your integrity. He's releasing them without any remorse. He doesn't look at you and say, oh, Jerry, it's you. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you alone. No, no, no. He looked at Jesus and said, I'm going to get you too. Please, for a second, just, and I say this to people all the time, just because I know that I preach on a stage from a Sunday or I have the title of saying lead pastor of Commission Church, the devil automatically says, oh, I can't mess with that dude. If at all anything, I'm on the front lines of the attack from the enemy day after day after day after day. Leaders who are listening to me, people that are listening to me that have integral roles. It might be in companies that you're leading. It could be in your jobs. It can be in your families. Fathers, I'm talking to you. Mothers, I'm talking to you. Young men and women, I'm talking to you. The devil doesn't like your integrity. The devil doesn't like your convictions. The devil doesn't like what you believe in. The devil doesn't like that you carry your Bible around. The devil doesn't like that you pray. The devil doesn't like that you're about to fast. And guess what he does? He will bring his forces to tear you down. I'm trying to put this in plain English as I can. No theological jargon here. Is there something going off? I don't know. Something. Okay. But here's what I want you to understand. Use the armor to win this spiritual battle you're in. You're looking at a blessing, but the devil is looking for an opportune time. Just because you went through that warfare two months ago, it doesn't mean you're done. This is not COVID. Oh, I had COVID. I'm not going to get it for the next four months or whatever. That, everybody has their own version of that. Am I talking to somebody? Like, like, no, no, no. It doesn't like give you this barrier of sorts. No, no, no. If, if he'll leave you, what is an opportunity? You know what Jesus, what happened to Jesus? The Bible says, and he tempted Jesus and Jesus said the word, 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 word. And the Bible says, and the devil, Satan, left him. Not left him, left him, left him. The Bible says he left him for an opportune time. Which means he put a bookmark on him and said, I'll be back. The devil went all oh, no, Schwarzenegger on him and said, ah, well, be buck. Come on, am I talking to somebody? Like, he is for real. He's like, I'm not messing around. You think I'm gone, but I'm not gone. I will be back. And I don't know how many of you understand the reality of that. That back could be one week. That back could be one day. That back could be one year. But don't just sit back and say, it's not going to happen to me because of me and because of my family and because I pray and I tithe and I give and I do this. Because here's what the enemy can tell you. If he can lie to you and say, as long as you can do all of this for people to see, maybe the stuff that's happening to you in private really doesn't matter. All that matters is this public thing that you have to put on. He's always looking for the, op what does that word opportune time mean? It means the most vulnerable time. Yes. Someone say vulnerable. vulnerable. That's what it means. It doesn't mean two years down. He's not going to give you a time and say, two years from now, you better be prepared. I'll be back. It's when you and I are vulnerable that spiritual attack happens. I need us to understand this. What does vulnerability look like? What does that look like? Temptation doesn't come at 2 p.m. It comes at 2 a.m. Like, like that, that's when temptation comes. Am I talking to somebody? Like nobody said at 3 p.m., oh, I want Whataburger. But 3 a.m., am I talking to my brothers here? Come on. I don't, I don't think the women do this, but the men do this. Like, three in the morning is when we want Whataburger. Some of you are like, Pastor, I don't know what you do at 3 a.m., but that's not what we do. <laughs> Sonia always says this. When she was pregnant, she, I was the one that had cravings, not her. <laughs> she was pregnant with, I think, our first child, and at three in the morning, she heard me, like, chomping on something, and she looked over, and I had watermelon in my hand, and I was eating watermelon. Come on, somebody. Who doesn't do that, right, men? Come on. No, you don't. <laughs> Only me, baby, I know. <laughs> but what does that opportune time look like for you? It's not a joke when they say no good things happen after midnight. You better brace yourself. Opportune time of vulnerability, it comes when you're weak. It comes when your guard is down. It comes when, man, he sends you that thought. If I can just make her open her social media right now. 
If I can just make somebody text him right now. The dilemma, man, I want to do good, but evil is present. My mind is for Jesus, but my body is saying, come this way. And that is what spiritual attack is. It's the constant fight that I know who I am, but my body wants to do this. And Paul says, I do what I don't want to do and the things that I shouldn't do, I, I keep doing it. This is the wretched being that I am. And, and God looks at each one of us and says, if you can have that conviction, that's a starting point. Amen. That is a starting point to defeat spiritual warfare, the conviction that says, I don't want to do it, but I'm pulled into it. Somebody help me. Pastor, help me. Brother, help me. Sister, help me. Wife, help me. Husband, help me. I don't want to do this, but my body is pulling me towards... Am I talking to somebody here? There are moments when you want to serve God, that you want to live for Him, which I, which I hope is all the time for you, but holiness is in your mind, but your body does what it wants to do. Like, have you ever been in a moment of deep worship? Like, it, it could be right here. You're like, you came to church, you're like, I'm going to get my worship on. Devil, you're a liar. I'm going to get my worship on. And you come and your hands are lifted and your hands are lifted. And suddenly out of nowhere, you're so distracted. Am I talking to somebody? Like, are you, have you been there? Like, y'all are looking at me crazy. Like, have you been in the middle of worship? Lord, I love you. Oh, I love somebody else too. Who's that person? Oh, I miss that person. And forget about the song. Forget about what's going on in church. You have the right intentions. Like, I wasn't even thinking about them, that, it, him, her, whatever that is. It could be food. It could be a person. It could be a, a, a sexual sin. Whatever it is. I wasn't even thinking about it. I came to worship, brother. I came to be, you know, drowned in worship. I came to listen to the word. I was taking notes. How many of you took notes? And we had five points. And when you came to three, you were taking copious notes. And you just stopped at point three because point four, you thought about the enchiladas you were about to have for lunch. <laughs> Bro, I ain't kidding. That's me. I was taking notes from Mike Santiago last week. And I was like, oh, man, so good, so good, so good. Oh, wow, preach pastor. And as soon as I said preach pastor, I got distracted. And I was like, Sonia, what did he say? I don't want to do it. That's not what my body wants. I know I'm a Christian. I know I'm a believer. But a vulnerable situation can happen to anybody. I'm aware when I'm vulnerable, I need friends. I need community. I need a mentor. I need the word. I need worship. I need, I, need, I need to get into the presence of God and say, God, I'm a wretched person. The things that I don't want to do, I do, God. And the things I should do, I don't do, God. Wretched, wretched, wretched. Sinner, sinner, sinner. God, would you heal me? But sometimes that, that plea and that cry comes in the form of people in your life. Sometimes it comes in the form of being accountable. Spiritual warfare, like, like, like the enemy loses his power in spiritual warfare where somebody can be accountable. Where somebody can say, you're not Jesus, trust me. Like you and I need to understand that. Oh, Jesus did it, brother. He took the word. He gave it out to the devil and he conquered the enemy. Uh, how's, been, how's that been working out for you? Genuinely, how's that been working out for you? If it hasn't, reevaluate. Because sometimes God brings people in your life. For every David, there's a Nathan in his life. Every king, every, and I want you to listen closely. Every king, till the time of Solomon, had a, had a, had a priest, had a prophet figure, had a, had a voice of reason, had a voice of God that came and spoke to him. Come enter this man called Solomon, the man that was filled with wisdom, and God gave him the riches of the world, the richest and the wisest. And the Bible says he was the first king that chose to not have a prophet over his life. That one act, history will go on to tell you, divided kingdoms. Literally took one kingdom that was united, even though they went through struggles, went through peace, went through torment, went through all seasons of life, which happens to every Christian, which happens to every believer. But the moment that nation and the leader of that nation let go of the prophetic voice, he allowed spiritual warfare to enter and conquer the nation. I want you to listen closely. 
If you don't have people to speak life over you, and if you don't have people that, that you can be honest with without being judged, I pray that you will find community like that. You will be exposed to community, that you will give in to community like that, where you don't get offended by what people correct you with and tell you with, be okay with asking the Holy Spirit to speak into you. When he made Adam, he said, it's not good for man to be alone. And he gave him a wife. Come on, somebody. I'm talking to some marriages today. If you are struggling in your marriage, husbands and wife, if you are struggling with something in your marriage, be vulnerable with your wife and your husband about it. He said, it's not good for a man. He doesn't say, he didn't say, I made a pastor for Adam. He didn't say, I made a mentor for Adam. He said, I gave him a wife. A woman that can stand by his side and trust a married man. Listen to me when I say this. It is important important for you to be raw and authentic with the things that you deal with, with your husband, with your wife. It is important for marriage. Oh, brother, I feel like I'll be judged. Really? Is that your worry? Vulnerability. If he can get you alone, if he can get you to a place where no one's watching, he can take you out. What does that opportune time look like? When he sees the door open, man, when he sees a little, you give him an inch, he takes her? You, th- that's just the devil. How familiar is he to your door? That's my question. Like, are you allowing your door to be creaked open? Do you have an open, policy, open door policy with the enemy? <laughs> oh, brother, I'm just open door. I'm transparent. Please don't. Please spare yourself the trouble and close that door. We don't need no open door policy with the devil. Oh, but brother, I'm just like that with everybody. No, close the door. Close the door. Like how familiar is he with your door? Like, does he knock and do you respond immediately? So you're like, someone on the door, let me get the door. I have two girls that love the, the, the doorbell. Anytime the doorbell rings, run, and they open the blinds. <laughs> I'm like, there you go. I can't, we, we, we can't not answer the door now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, we were going to ignore it. We were going to get on the ring and be like, who's there? No, I can't do that anymore. You know what I'm saying? Like, like <laughs> like, how much of access does he give? Have you, have you, there are some people in your life that they'll just keep ringing the doorbell. You don't listen. But that, that determines closeness. I have different people in my life. There are people in my life that know that they can ring the doorbell three times. And they just have to stay there because we're expecting them. Am I talking to somebody? And it's okay because we might be somewhere else. We didn't hear the doorbell. But they know that I was expecting them. They know that they're family. They know that they're close to us. So they can keep ringing the doorbell because I was expecting them. But then there are other people that will ring the doorbell once and they don't know if I'm home or not, that if I've invited them or not, they will ring the doorbell and then they will say, probably there's nobody, let's leave. But the problem is that so many of us have allowed the enemy to become so complacent and familiarized with us that we're okay with them just ring, ring, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, to the point where you're like, ah, I try to avoid it, Jesus, but he keeps ringing. Why did he keep ringing the doorbell? Because somewhere you allowed, you allowed access. Two months ago, you opened the door. Am I talking to somebody? And he knows that if he just stands there long enough, maybe a a non-invitation would turn out to be a, come on in, don't stay for long. But that don't stay for long turns out into longer. This is important, church. Like, does he have a key to your house? There are not a lot of people that know the passcode to the door of my house. And I trust them with everything in this world. If I give them a passcode to my... Some of you are like, oh, just a garage cord, pastor. No, 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 that's still a door. Right. That is still a door. No, 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 it's just a back. Oh, no, he comes with it. He loves the back door. <coughs> Please don't be fooled. It, you might think of it as a garage, but that place... It, mm, I, y'all not getting it. Forget it. <laughs> but the promise of the Lord is this. In Isaiah 59, 19, worship team, you guys can get ready to come up. The promise of the Lord is this. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. The enemy doesn't come like trinkling waters, soothing waters. No, no, no. He comes in like a flood. He comes to destroy. He comes to kill. Flood never comes in and says, ding dong, can I come in? No, no, no. He he says, bam, I'm going to destroy everything you have. 
What happens when the flood water enters your house? You better know that you got to rip up some drywall. That's all the flood wants to do, is to destroy a portion of your home. But pastor, not everything's destroyed, pastor. We've mitigated the, that didn't have to happen, did it? Like we could have avoided the, the three feet of drywall that you had to rip up because these floods came and caused damage. And some of us are sitting and be like, ah, oh, it's okay, pastor. There's no sign of the flood. The waters have gone away. And for so many of us without our knowledge, there's so much of stuff that's happening behind the surface that we have no idea about. And one year down the line, it starts stinking your house and you're like, where's the smell coming from? It smells like mold in here. You didn't address what had to be addressed when the floodwaters hit your house. You try to brace, you try to cover it up, you try to say, hey, you know what, we're not gonna, we're not gonna deal with this, we don't need to deal with this, let's just go ahead and mask it, let's just go and put some Febreze on it. Love it, Febreze works wonders. As long as we have some Febreze, nothing else can harm this house. No, 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 so many of us are Febreze Christians. We're okay. What are you laughing for, girl? <laughs> Not that I'm saying she's a Febreze Christian. I'm just saying she, she, she's having a good old time. That's my wife, y'all. That's my wife. That's my wife. But here's what I'm trying to understand. Is, is we're wanting blessing, but man, man, the flood comes in. Floods you with temptation to quit. Floods you with compromise. Ooh. Can I read one more verse? Is that good? Okay. First, go in, first Thessalonians 3 verses 5. First Thessalonians 3, 5. This is what the Bible says. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. You know, sometimes like a pa as a pastor, this is exactly my worry. Can I break this down for you? Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica. We, we went through the Thessalonian study, right? And we went through this passage. Like, how many of you have been left unread? Anybody? Like, like you know that you send a text message, they read it. Like, if you send a message to me and I don't respond to you, like in three days, like, that's me, right? Thank you, Jamie. Jamie knows exactly what I'm talking about. Like, how many of you have been left? And, and, and Paul has been left on red. He's like, bro, I've been trying to reach you. I've been trying to send you text messages. I've been trying to send you greeting cards. I've been trying to check in on you guys, but I am worried. You know what the biggest, here's, here's what happens when the enemy draws you to, and you're going through spiritual warfare, you detach yourself completely. Sometimes it's the guilt and the shame and you're like, I don't want to talk to people. You'd rather detach yourself and not allow people to have access to you and speak life over you rather than have to bear your emotions and for people to read through you. So you'd be okay with so many things that you compromise with. Paul is like, man, I've been, I'm worried that I wasted my time. I'm worried that someone got to you. I'm worried and I'm afraid that this tempter has tempted you. Like, I'm afraid that you're not serving where you're supposed to be serving anymore. I'm afraid because you used to serve three times a month and now it's like no times a month. Like, I'm seeing no passion inside of you. Like, you arrive late on Sunday mornings. Like, after the third song, just because you want to just be there for the word. Like, I'm worried about you. Like, you don't stay back after service anymore. I'm worried about you. Like, you avoid community at all costs. I'm worried about you. I'm afraid that the tempter has tempted you. I'm afraid that you're going to quit. I'm afraid that you're going to compromise. Mm. This is what I want to I encourage you with. He's anxious. Paul is anxious for this church in Thessalonica. He's so worried. He's waiting for their news. He's waiting for them to say, Pastor, we're good. We're, we're doing good. Thanks for planting the church. We're, we're solid in our faith. We're standing strong in our faith. He's refreshing his Instagram feed. He's like, no, no updates as yet. Twitter's not working. No, no updates on Twitter either. Like, are you there? Like, are you still a follower of Jesus Christ? Like, are you still serving Jesus? Are you still faithful? Like, has the tempter got to you? Spiritual warfare is real and God is looking at some of us and saying, depend on Jesus. The only way you're going to be able to fight it is when you depend on Jesus more than you depend on yourself. When you say, God, give us today our daily bread like every single thing depend on God for. 
Like telling God, I need strength, I need forgiveness, I need deliverance, I need deliverance from temptation, I need faith, I need provision. Because you can't overcome with Jesus. Would you stand up to your feet with me? This is important that you fight the good fight. Because the fight will take you to the reward. The good fight always has a reward. Remember that. Negative expressions of fighting will always end with bad stuff happening. This reward is never connected to bad fighting. Where there's good fight involved, there's always a reward. Here's what I want to encourage you with. Stay in it till the very end. It's a long game. It's not a, it's not a shortcut. It's not a, hey, I'm just in this for the time being. That's not what it is. Like, don't give in to the addiction of this one thing to compromise the whole thing. You didn't hear that, so I'm going to repeat it one more time. Do not, do not give in to the addiction of the one thing and compromise the whole thing. It's not worth it. The back row didn't get it, so I'm going to repeat it one more time. Don't give in to the addiction of the one thing and compromise the whole thing. It's not worth it. It's not about this short time of love with Jesus and say yes to Jesus and all this good stuff. It's fight the good fight. It's the confidence of saying, I kept my faith. So what we'll be talking about, I kept my faith. I didn't let go of it. Kept my faith means I held it close to my heart. I didn't sacrifice. I didn't let go. I didn't, I didn't trade it off for, for, the, for the virtues of the world, for the stuff of the world. No, 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 no. I kept it. And the last thing he says is I stayed faithful. Like this is deep. I'll stay faithful. I'll fight the good fight. Matthew 25, 21, the Bible says this, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter the joy of your master. The Bible doesn't say, well done, my fruitful servant. That's all Christians want. As long as, long as they're fruitful, they're good. God says, no, well done, my faithful servant. Your faithfulness matters. Someone say, faithfulness matters. I fought the fight. I have ran my race. I have kept my faith. Someone say, kept my faith. Kept has this meaning of faithfulness. I have kept it so close to my heart. I don't know how many of you, but I keep things that are very close to my heart. I love cards. I love cards. When my wife, every card that my wife has given me from the time that we started dating, I've kept those cards. Every one of them. I love keeping stuff. Some people call it hoarding. I, I call it emotional love, attachment. I keep stuff. You only keep things that matter to you, that, that, are, that have significance in the long run. I want to I reiterate to you and say, Jesus, when he gave his life to you, it wasn't for the moment. He, he had the long, the, the, he, he looked at you in the long term and he said, I love you unconditionally. Even when you fail and falter and, and make mistakes, I will still love you. And the love of the cross is an unfailing kind of love. I need some of us to understand this church. stay faithful the biggest threat to the enemy and your biggest strength in spiritual warfare is your faithfulness your unwavering faith in saying no matter what happens I will stay faithful to the cause it doesn't matter how hard my marriage is going to get I will stay faithful to the cause no matter how difficult it gets no matter how difficult my job gets God if you have planted I will make sure that I bloom in this place that you planted. God, I know it hurts, but if this is your plan, I will be faithful. Thank you for listening. We love bringing you the word on so many different platforms. We are so thankful for what God is doing in and through us. 
We'd love for you to subscribe so you don't miss out. And don't forget to share this message if it has blessed you.